everyone. Thanks for joining us for another session. We're doing our Q&A. Uh, we're winding up for the month. We're a couple of days late, but we've had a bunch of rain. There's more coming in today. But uh, because of popular demand, after the last Q&A we did, I was asked to bring my lovely wife, Allie, back to the program. <laughs> Good morning, yeah. darling. Good morning, Donnie. <laughs> He's Q and I'm A. And yeah. we're going to answer your fishing questions this morning. I'm Q and you're A. Uh, that's cute. Uh, okay. At <laughs> any rate, uh, we do have a tropical storm coming. So we came out early to rush this in because we're already two days late with it. But we have a little window this morning. So we're going to try to do it for you and get it out of the way so we can begin our study, as I promised, on, on mapping interpretation, which is coming up later this week. All right. So first question, Allie. Jeff Brick has a question. He said, I'm excited about the upcoming segment on mapping and interpretation. Buck says, for a structure to produce, it must lead all the way from the shallows to the deep, specifically the deepest water in the lake, the deepest water in an area of a lake, or the deepest water available. Jeff's been paying attention. He's been reading the book, I can <laughs> tell. My lake has deep water everywhere. It's kind of like Palm de Terre, where you won your muskie tournament. What? My question is, what makes you choose one particular structure over another? Yeah, that's a really good question, and there's there's a stock single answer to that. But I'm going to, since you mentioned Palm de Terre, I'm going to elaborate a little bit about how we found that structure on that lake at that particular time. So let me elaborate a little bit. When I went out there to Palm de Terre with my old partner, Tommy, I had been apprenticeshipping under Buck for approximately five years at that point. I had been fishing with him many, many, many times. I had learned my lessons. I had studied all my material. I was well grounded in all of the structure fishing information by the time I went out there. I had to gather from all of that knowledge that Buck had shared with me. I had done my studies and he had me out there fishing, but most importantly, I had to pull from that. And when you're pulling from your overall knowledge, it's not something that takes five or 10 minutes or 20 minutes to sit down and figure out. It's just like in a matter of seconds, you know what you should do. You know what you're looking for. You know why you're looking for it and you know where to go look for it. And then you, you recognize it when you find it and then you just go to fishing. So when we got to Palm de Terre, like I was talking last week at Buck wrote back to Danny Carpenter on this map, Palm de Terre was the same way. Big lake, lots of stuff. We could have picked any place in that lake. I mean, it was loaded with structure. And one looked better than the next. They all looked great. But don't forget, we were fishing for muskie. Now in the food chain, let's get this straight. God created all these fish. He put the crustaceans up there along the bank. He put the little baby minnows up there real shallow. And then the bigger minnows and then the chubs and, and the larger uh, bait fish. And then after that came, in the stacking form, the, after that came the panfishes, after that came the bass, after that came the walleyes, and lastly, the biggest fish, the biggest predator in that food chain are the northern pike and the muskie. So they're our deepest fish. They're deep to start with, average uh, sanctuary zone between 45 and 55 feet. So we know we're looking for a deep fish. So I need to find some deep structure breaking into deep water, obviously. However, on the Friday night after that dinner, you remember me telling the story, there was a cold front that came through that was horrendous. After that front goes through, those fish get dormant. They drop even deeper than their normal sanctuary zones and they become very dormant. Normally they don't uh, get back on track for three or four days. So when we looked at that cold front that came through that night, it was so terrible. Buck used to judge the severity of the front by the difference in the air temperatures of the two uh, uh, high pressure and the low pressure. In this case, it was 75 on practice day. It was 42 on the day the tournament started. A 30 degree difference, a 30 degree change in temperature. That was the most severe front I can remember ever uh, having to fish in. It was terrible. So now I have what I already know is a deep fish starting. I've got the worst weather condition in the world that I know is going to drive them deeper. I have no, absolutely no idea of trying to find a school of muskie. Not going to happen. They're downstairs and they're not going to be moving 
<laughs> for days. So, with all of that, I established that in my mind in about four seconds. Then as we had our practice day and went out and looked at the lake, we noticed that down in the dam area where everything was headquartered, those structures were beautiful. They were terrific. But the water was clear as a bell. So we also knew that we needed to go up the reservoir to try to find a little better water color, even though there was great structure down at the dam. So when you're asking the question of Palm de Terre, how did we choose that structure? It kind of chose us, if you get my drift. I had to call on all of my Buckberry knowledge, and it sent me up the reservoir for a whole bunch of reasons. We knew that a straggler fish or two could win that tournament because of how bad the situation was. We knew. Where would we really have the best chance of catching a fish? Even just catching one. It would be downstairs. And if we go towards the headwaters and find good water color, we still had 35 foot in breaking. And we still had 70 feet or 60 feet of water, something like that. So we still had plenty of deep stuff but we had better watercolor. We had a chance to get a few straggler fish to come up to that depth. And down at the dam, those it was so clear, those fish would have never, ever reached 35 or 45 feet. No, no way, period. So when it came to that situation, it was my knowledge that sent me to that structure where we caught those four fish and won that tournament. And my overall interpretation if you review that story, you'll understand what I'm saying, how true it is, because not one other fish was caught. Two, 200 guys, not one other fish was caught. So, in your overall fishing, your, your knowledge is going to put you in the best place where you have the best chance to catch a fish under that particular weather and water condition. Now, with all that being said, if you want to know how I would choose a structure in a lake, in a big lake, lots of stuff, big lake, lots of stuff, structure everywhere, how do I make a choice of where I'd really rather fish? Well, the stock answer would be this. If all of the conditions were equal, same water color all over the lake, there's no advantage in that, which structure would I choose if they all looked like they were productive. I would choose the structure that broke the deepest into the deepest water in the lake. Simple reason. If I have a hundred structures in this lake and they all broke off at 27 feet into the channel, and then I had one other that broke at 37 feet into the channel, that's the one I choose, but why? I would choose the one that broke at 37 feet because I may have a movement of fish that reaches 37 feet, but they never get to 27. They stop at 37, I limit out. But if I had been fishing one of the 27s, I, I would have never come in contact with a fish. So you're always gonna pick the one that's breaking the deepest to the deepest water if all other things are equal. If we have a water color difference and a, and a preference, then we use that. But bottom line answer, which one do I like the best? The one that breaks the deepest. Next question. All right, next we have a question from Phil Safransky. I understand that fish adapt to weather and water conditions, but how are movements impacted by Florida summer weather with sudden storms developing most every day, like today? Like today. Only to, only to dissipate just as suddenly, and then repeat the same process again the very next day. So how does the Florida weather affect? Well, from what I heard on the weather forecast, this is not going to dissipate for about four or five days. But at any rate, I got, got a good an book. I got an answer. Hey, for I you. got a good book for you. Get this one. Hunker down. <laughs> Go, baby. Well, Phil, that's a question I'm not exactly sure how to answer it. But if we wait a little bit longer today, I might be able to get an idea what the answer is. This rain's supposed to be just horrible. Uh, but at any rate. Uh, let me answer it like this. It's important that people realize in Florida, there's a good side, there's a bad side. There's good news and then there's the flip. There's the flip side. And the flip side is in Florida, we have very shallow lakes. We also, on the other side of that coin, we have 12 months growing season. We have big bass. We have lots of big fish in Florida. 
on the other side of the fence again, uh, because we have shallow lakes, that means we have shallow break in structure. On the good side, on the going back to the heads of this coin, I can fish 12 months out of the year. And we're living in a tropical environment. It's a lot better than beating myself up with that snow and ice up there in Pennsylvania. So there's good and there's bad. But here's a translation. No matter what the weather is or what the water conditions or the weather uh, might give us, we know that those are the two things control activity of the fish. However, we can have active fish in Florida. But are we going to get them up to that structure, to the depth where that structure is breaking off? We spend a lot of time in Florida. I hate to admit it, but it's true. We spend a lot of time on those one-sided bars straggler fishing. I don't expect to see a school of 400 bass up in 10 feet of water. Like never. Almost never. Now, there will be times when I can spend a day and catch 20 fish, but they were all straggler fish. I just stayed on it all day long because the fish never moved to 10 feet. And in many cases, my lake only gave me structure that broke at 10 feet was the last place I could fish. So, at times in Florida, you'll be working that one-sided bar and all of a sudden, bang, 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 bang. You might catch eight or 10 or 12 or 14 fish right in a row. That was a definite activity period. But to get a mass of fish up on structure like what we like to have, like up north, sitting there at 27 feet where I catch them every day, or 37 feet where I can catch them every day. We don't have that down here. We have shallow lakes and shallow breaking stuff. So we have to really have great weather condition. A warm front where maybe it just drizzles rain for five straight days every day. But then we can get some movements of fish up. However, your question was, how does the daily storms in the summer months, how does it affect the movements of the fish? I can't see it affecting it any differently than it does anywhere else, but I can't really put it to the test because I only have shallow features that I can fish, relatively shallow features. We, we found a good break line the other day. I was out with my son and my grandson and my wife. And we found a nice break line in this lake. It was at 17 feet, breaking into 25 feet. Now that is really unusual for Florida. But we found it and we fished it and grandson caught a good bass. I think his picture was on Instagram the other day. Uh, but at any rate, it's unusual. So in Florida, we got to have the fish come to us. Otherwise, even though we're fishing next to the deep water, we're pretty much straggler fishing an awful lot in Florida. I hope that answers your question. Okay, next. All right, we've got a question from Eric. I can't pronounce his last name, so we're just gonna say Eric C. You'll know who you are. In the situation you described while winning that musky tournament at Palm de Terre, how fast were you trolling and was your lure bumping the bottom or free running? When I'm fishing deep structure, I always want my lure on the bottom, period, end of story. Now, I was using a 700 spoon plug catching those muskies, by the way, on wire. And I asked my wife to put a few uh, 700s out here so I could demonstrate what I wanted, wanted to demonstrate to you. And wouldn't you know, she picked a pink one. <laughs> she uses these a lot. I don't. So I had my 700 spoon plug, and it was bumping the bottom just like that. And this is a good time for me to bring this up. We have film of free running lures going through a school of fish that they don't pay any attention to it. Then we bring a bottom bumping lure through there and every fish tries to get it. The bottom bouncing lure triggers something in a fish that forces them to strike that lure. I'm not even sure Buck knows what it is. He thinks it was just the pugnacious uh, uh, nature of a fish. But the bumping, pow, you hit a fish, come free running, nothing. So. Always, I want my lure bumping the bottom. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in Florida, sometimes you have mucky bottoms, you can't bump the bottom. But when you can, you want that lure bumping the bottom, period. Uh, so not free running. If I'm not bumping, I gotta let out some more line. I gotta get that lure bumping. Now, how fast was I going? 
the water was still relatively warm, even though it was a slow presentation, basically because of the depth we were in and the nature of the weather condition, we knew those fish wouldn't be real active. So we had pretty much a slow bump going when we caught those muskies. So that answers that question. But I do want to just add right here, Buck had a friend, this is a good place to add it. Buck had a friend who was a college professor, friend of his, uh, college professor up at uh, Georgia University, a bulldog. And he had done some audio tests on lures, free running, and then he did a test on the spoon plug, bottom bumping. He actually tested the spoon plug two ways, free running once, and Buck built these lures to have two flutes in the on the side, one in, in the back and uh, in, in the tail area and, and the lip in the front, because that sends out vibrations in the water, left, right, front, and back. And when a lure is coming through the water, these audio vibrations, the fish hear, it's how they hear through their lateral lines. Uh, so uh, when he ran the spoon plug, he said it was by far the loudest lure, just running it, you know, uh, free running. He said, but then he went back and did, redid the test with the lure bump in the bottom. And he said to Buck, there's only one way to describe that. It sounds like a freight train down there. Ow. When you have that knowledge in your head, I'm always thinking about that. When I'm not bumping, I'm not happy. I got to get that lure bumping. I want those fish to know that that's there. I want them to know that that lure is there. They can't take it unless they see it. Sometimes they can't see it unless they first hear it and become aware of it. So always, when you're fishing deep structure, you want your lure bumping the bottom. Period. Here's the next question from Brian D. Do you consider the dam in a reservoir to be a one-sided bar? What are your thoughts as to fishing the riprap that runs all the way to the bottom of the dam? Okay, Brian D., I understand why you asked that question. And yeah, you actually, you're fishing it kind of like you'd be fishing a one-sided bar. You know, it's pretty much straight past stuff. However, I don't consider it a one-sided bar. I just consider it the riprap at the dam. Now, how do I fish it? If I'm fishing a dam or a causeway, I'll start with a 500 spoon plug. If I got two guys in a boat, 500, 400, we'll make a pass. If I catch a fish in the shallows, I'll loop around, make another pass through there. If I catch a second fish, I will stop and go to the cast. I will anchor my boat sort of parallel with the dam or the causeway. And I'll take a 250 spoon plug and I'll cast parallel to that dam hold my rod up and just crank the bait in and then I'll throw a little out here and then I'll throw a little out here and I'll fan cast around that boat. And if there's any activity beyond those two fish that we just caught, I'll know about it by fan casting in a half moon. And if I don't catch any more fish on the cast, I'm back to the troll. Now, if I catch some more fish on the cast, I'm going to get deeper pretty quick. There's a school of fish. There's an activity period. So, uh, let's assume that we just hit one fish, went back, we didn't catch a second fish, I keep on going. Once I uh, fish the entire causeway or the entire dam, I'll then reverse back 250s, run 200s, and start just stacking the lures. And I'll stack, somebody asked me just the other day, how far down do you go? How far down do you stack your lures? I go to the base of the dam, to where there's no more rocks. And that will end. Once you get to the base and there's no more rocks, I'm done with my fish. And many times you'll find those areas that are a little bit different. And that's where you're going to find your fish. There's always a reason. Uh, but that's how you fish a dam or a causeway. Dennis Radke has a question. Thanks so much for your video on catching largemouth bass in a natural lake. It reinforced for me all of what you have been teaching. I've been studying the green book and practicing on a couple of lakes around the Tampa, Florida area. I wanted to ask you if you would mind telling me the name of the lake you were fishing in that video. Not at all. <laughs> Actually, if you would, you must have just saw a clip because if you would have seen the whole video, I did announce and I remember you putting up there on the screen the, the name of the lake, but it's Big Lake Kissimmee, which by the way is sort of down there near Kissimmee. <laughs> <laughs> what a coincidence. Uh, at any rate, <laughs> they couldn't think of what to call the lake, so they, what the heck, we'll call it Big Lake Kissimmee. Uh, at any rate, it's one of my favorite bass lakes. It's a terrific lake. And uh, like a lot of the lakes in Florida, got a lot of that hydrilla problem going on. But 
<clears throat> in a lot of cases, those deeper areas that I'm fishing are clean from the hydrilla. So, uh, yeah, that's a great lake. And, and don't anybody out there ever mistake, I'm not going to try to keep secrets from you. My job is to get you catching fish. I want you to catch fish. That's the whole idea why I'm doing this. So, yeah, uh, I'm happy to tell you that was Lake Kissimmee, and it's a great lake, and it's pretty close to you. Next question is from Chris Fendelson. <clears throat> Fendelson. What's yeah. with me? I don't know. She's Fendelson. That's probably, probably... That's probably Swedish. Maybe. Is it Erdesvenska? <laughs> the next question is from Chris. I have a bar in the <laughs> island... <laughs> You're I not, have a bar. You're not even trying. No, Chris has a bar. It's Fendelson. We it's like go. Mendelson. You're a musician. It's like Mendelson, Fendelson. Got it. Chris Fendelson. Chris. He has a bar in the Highland One Reservoir that extends from the shoreline and breaks off at a depth of 35 feet into 60 feet of water. But the 60 foot water is a large flat that runs out and eventually drops into the river channel, which is 100 feet deep. In this example, would you consider the 60 foot to be the deepest water in the area or would you consider it the channel to be the home of the fish? And the 60 foot flat would then block any possible migration to the bar. Man, that's technical. It's technical, but it's a great question and really deserves a little bit of time. So let me answer it for you. Cool. Okay, Chris, good question. And this is a question that comes up not only in a Highland one, but comes up in any reservoir fishing. And not so much in natural lakes, but in reservoir fish, and it comes up a lot. Guys will ask me, well, it broke into X depth. In your case, it broke into 60 feet. But then it's 60 foot for just kind of all around, and then eventually it gets out to into the channel, and the channel's 75 feet deep, or it's 100 feet deep. And, and Buck always talks about uh, in a reservoir, we have to figure. We have to just assume that the home of the fish is always the channel. Even if it's not, we have to interpret our lake by thinking in terms of the home of the fishes in the, ch in the channel. Well, in a lot of different kinds of reservoirs, you'll get this situation where it's really plenty deep enough for a sanctuary zone, but it's not actually the channel. Well, then the question comes up, where do you make the distinction? How far or how long is this area before it breaks into the channel? Would I consider a flat or would I be looking for any small little side feeder cuts or something that's maybe going to uh, lead to fish uh, and they really are originating in the channel? Or would I consider it to be the deepest water in the area? That's a question you can't put a number on. Chris, you just can't put a number on it. I can't say 75 yards or 40 yards. A buck could never say. But anytime there was a question, if the bar looked terrific, fish the bar. Doesn't take long. Fish the bar and, and fish it hard in a half hour, and normally you'll have an answer. You catch a few fish, you got your answer. You know. And if it's breaking 35 feet to 60 feet, you know, that's a good looking bar. Now, do they originate from the 60 feet? I don't know. And it's hard for me to make a judgment on a spot that I haven't personally seen. I've been in situations where I got the feeling, no, nope, that's too far. That's a dead end. They're not, they're not, no, I'm not going to fish that. And then I move on. But if I can't see your situation, I can't really say one way or the other, but I can say this. If you're in doubt, fish the bar. It looks and sounds like you have plenty of, of good uh, features that you can, of course, it's a highland. You have plenty of features you can fish. Uh, and see see if the fish will give you the answer. In most cases, when I was in doubt, I fished the structure anyhow and caught a couple of fish. I had my answer. Fish answered it for me. So that's the best way. Uh, and keep in mind, even though we interpret from the channel towards the bank, the home of the fish, we can't always figure it just absolutely is the channel. We could have situations, and many times there'll be situations which you, you just didn't see. There was a side cut. There was a little ditch that ran up. I ran into that in Ohio one time. There was a ditch that ran up and, and made a structure productive that I never thought would produce. I thought it was too flat and wouldn't go, but, but the fish were there. And once I caught the fish by checking it, then I went and really detailed that structure and found that little ditch that was leading the fish. So 
When in doubt, fish the structure and let the structure and the fish give you the answer. Right now we have a three-part question from Chris Manis. I'm retired and living in Kalamazoo. I've been a student of yours and Buck's for 30 years. Wow, that's a long time. Long time to be putting up with me. You ought to be getting <laughs> this stuff pretty soon, don't you think? That was good. I like that, Chris. <laughs> you and I are buds, period. That's it. I currently fish the nearby Kalamazoo River for smallmouth and pike. Most of the natural lakes and rivers near me have a deep weed line and are very clear. Now the river affords me better water color and better overall conditions. I have the following questions. My river has a maximum depth of about 11 feet on the outside bends, and I'm wondering if everything you and Buck talk about when it comes to rivers, lakes, and reservoirs apply even to small and medium-sized rivers. For instance, do river fish school? Do they migrate in the spring and fall? And lastly, is the home of the fish in the deepest holes? He's a good student of yours, isn't he? Those are great questions. Years. I like it. Chris, let me thank you for following me for all of those years. I know there's some guys out there that have been around me for a long time. I just don't hear from them much, you know. But uh, there's a lot of guys out there that started 30 years ago and been catching a lot of fish. I'm glad you're catching some fish in that river. But I wouldn't be afraid to go fish some of those natural lakes either. I, I You know, to me, I, I look at it as a challenge. But to answer your questions about the rivers, first, yes. Well, you asked three questions. The answers to those all three questions are yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yes, river fish school. I can show you a spot, which we're going to be talking about in our map and interpretation in Menaki, where <laughs> there's about 10,000 fish caught off the same spot <laughs> in a river. Yeah, river fish school, <clears throat> number one, fish school, period, no matter where they're living. Uh, two, do they uh, migrate seasonally? Yes, they do. Uh, and depending on the river, the size of the river and the bottom conditions, there's a lot that goes into that that we'll leave for another discussion. But yes, they do migrate seasonally. And then you're on the outside bends, which is the right place to be. Uh, but you say the maximum depth is 11 feet. Now, here's the one point I want to make with you. I answered the question, yes, they take deep water as a home. And we describe deep water as anything deeper than 10 feet. And when I came to Florida, Buck made sure on my first trip down here that he made sure I understood when he said deep water is a home to fish even in Florida, where they say there is no deep water, there is deep water. He said, but there is a cutoff spot. There's a cutoff number. And he said that number is 10 feet. He said, if you don't have 10 feet of water in a lake, or in your case, in a river, the fish will take the junk, they'll take their rock piles, they'll take their stick-ups, they'll take their weeds, they'll take some sort of cover to escape uh, those horrible light rays and the things that really bother them. They'll take cover rather than deep water. And the cutoff for that is 10 feet. So if your river has 11 feet, they'll be in deep water. But if you just had 7 feet is the deepest in the river, you'd have to start looking and throwing to all of the junk. Anyway, good luck to you, buddy. Uh, I really do appreciate you, and, and uh, let me know. Send me some pictures sometime of some of the fish you're catching. I'd appreciate getting that so I can give you a shout-out. Okay, next question. I have a question here from Richard Brown. My lake is over 50 feet deep, and I have a seriously hard time fishing deeper than 50 feet. What's the answer, Don? Okay, that's an easy one. We'll, we'll, we'll start with that. Mr. Brown. Uh, let me just say that in case you've missed some of the earlier vlogs, we stressed the fact that we never, ever fish deep water. We only fish deep structure. Exactly. I, I should have brought her out here earlier. I don't even have I'm to learning answer. This stuff. She knows this stuff. <laughs> but that, that is the truth. See, we're only focusing on our structure. You'll see when we get into this discussion on mapping and interpretation that we start thinking in terms of the migration of the fish, we start thinking from the channel. However, if your channel is 100 feet, that doesn't mean the fish are living in 100 feet. They're living at the channel, but at the average uh, sanctuary for a bass is 35 feet. Average for walleye is 45. And then the larger species, the northern and the musky, more like 50 to 55 feet. But they're not living down there in 100 feet. If they were, we'd be in trouble. 
So keep in mind, don't worry so much about the depth and don't be fishing deep water. You can only fish the features that you can read. So we're fishing deep structure, not deep water. Okay, next. Good answer. Oh, and you had it right. She had it right. <laughs> okay, our next question is from Jeff Brick. Have you ever thought about making a quick tip guidebook that I could take with me to the lake? It's hard for me to remember all of the information when I'm on the water. I've read all of the Buck Perry material. I have not missed a single video. We love that. Hit the bell. That's good. All right. We've not missed a single video, but it sure would be nice to have something to take with me to the lake when I go fishing. And I would gladly pay for it, is what he said. Funny he should mention that. hundred bucks? <laughs> Do I hear too? <laughs> we'll put this up for oh, auction. Man. Yeah, okay. Hawaii, here we come. That's a good question. <laughs> I've got an answer for you. Jeff, I can't tell you how timely that question was. You know, it was quite a few years ago as I was making my attempt at educating uh, the fishermen. It came to me that in my early days of, of my apprenticeship with Buck, I was so swamped with all of the material and all of the information, I really was struggling with how I could put that out on the water every time I went fishing. I really was. And I always wanted to, you know, please Buck and, and, and make him proud and all of that. So it, it just got to a point where my head about was ready to explode. So I started thinking, just a few years back, I started thinking and remembering about that time when it was all so great, but at the same time so confusing, I just couldn't put it all together out on the water. So I started uh, and spent about a year of breaking down to its simplest form what I would do each and every day when I was out there on that water. And I wanted to eliminate everything that wasn't absolutely necessary and really break it down to what I would call what you just referred to, sort of a daily guide, uh, a book that was just sort of a tip on what I needed to do each and every time out on the water in order to be successful. I couldn't leave anything out, but at the same time, I wanted to simplify everything. And I wanted to pass that along to the fishermen. Now, I've been getting a bunch of questions like yours, sort of the same idea. And then you just made it specific. And that triggered uh, my wife and I to start thinking, why don't we just redo that book, reprint that book? It's about 38 or 40 pages, as I recall. And it really is your daily instructional guide to what you need to be doing out there on the water, whether you're fishing in Florida, Minnesota, New York, California, it doesn't matter. And each and every step that's pointed out will guard against you missing anything. So Allie's been working on this for a few weeks now and it's a little more difficult than I originally thought for her to bring this up to date and make it perfect. But it's going to be available pretty soon as a download. So be looking for it and of course uh, when it's ready to go, I'll be sure to let everyone know. So thanks for your question, and I hope that that's going to be a help to a lot of people. Okay, that was our last question. So we'd like to thank you all for being with us today. Great. That was the last question. Well, yeah. So we made it through before the rain hit. That's great. And I want to thank you for being with us today. I hope you learned something. And I want to thank my lovely assistant, Allie, for being with me again today. No problem, Coach. Happy to help you. A lot easier when she's here. <laughs> but, you know, when I first started doing these videos, when we'd come to the end, I had no knowledge of social media and how things work, and she had to constantly remind me what to say to close out a video. And I was just tongue-tied. I don't know why I couldn't get that stuff out, and I still have a problem with it. So today, since she's here, I'm going to let her take us home. Close oh. us out, baby. Here we go. Come on now. We'd like you to follow us on Instagram. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and while you're there watching the videos, make sure you click like on the video and ring the bell so you get notifications. By the way, be sure to send some more questions in for the next q and I'm having a good time with it, and I really want to get your questions answered, so don't be shy. Send in some questions, and we'll see you the next time.